So let's go ahead and jump to Jim and Hi, Ivy. Well. Okay, thank you, Jack. I appreciate you. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge that um, we hope to tap into as we go forward. But now we need to switch gears and go to uh, Jim and Ivan. They both have a pretty solid presentation ready to go. Um, both of them are Ranger veterans. Both of them are very experienced in organizing communities. And Jim has been teaching essentially a, uh, this is a condensed version of a class he teaches throughout Arizona, right, Jim? Correct. Go for it. You got the floor. <clears throat> um, did you want to go ahead and do the, uh, read the definition of a neighborhood yeah. watch with teeth as kind of a policy? Yeah, this is, this is our definition of a neighborhood watch with teeth. You understand what that means. And unlike a standard neighborhood watch or block watch program, where the local police department or county sheriff expects you to dial 911 or perhaps use a direct line to a business admin office, our program takes neighborhood watch to a whole new level. Oath Keepers will train your neighborhood watch group to a level of expertise never seen in, the, in these programs before. <clears throat> Currently, neighborhood watch incorporates crime prevention, counterterrorism, and disaster preparedness. And it's an historic fact that police are often overwhelmed during serious natural or man-made disasters and unable to respond, leaving citizens on their own. This is, this is the current reality in the wake of hurricanes, earthquakes, other natural disasters. Um, Larry, if you could scroll down the screens a little bit so I can keep reading this. It's our official statement on this. Um, you know, this is the way it goes. Whether it's going to be a, a, a natural disaster like a hurricane or a tornado or the aftermath of, of an earthquake or in the long term, like an economic collapse or EMP, um, any kind of extensive civil unrest, you're going to have to stand up, take responsibility for yourselves, your family, and your neighborhood. If you don't, you're not going to be secure. And this is the one thing I always harp on with preppers. Having your four walls be your perimeter is not going to keep you safe. You've got to reach out to your neighbor and form a neighborhood watch with teeth. You must use a second amendment for what is intended, the God-given right of self-defense for yourselves, your families, and the duty to defend your community as well. Larry, scroll down, would you? Um, anyway, just, I'm, I'm, I'll put this up online afterwards. The point, the main point is, is you got to take out, take care of each other. Your only security is in collective security in your community. There's no such thing as going it alone and, and being a lone wolf, um, alpha male, and surviving. It's not going to happen. You got to come together. The founders expected you to be the militia, and it means all of you with your neighbors. And a big point that Jack touched on is that no police officer, firefighter, EMT, or any other first responder is going to leave home and go do their jobs unless their family is safe. It's the way it goes. So there must be a neighborhood watch in place with the ability to defend their homes and their family and keep them secure so they can project out and help the broader community. So the neighborhood watch is essential. Um, it's essentially the most important building block. After that, then it goes to your churches and then to your towns. And one last point I want to make before we jump over to Jim and Ivan is that when it comes to, to distributing food security, you have to have beans, beans and rice and, and other cheap food like that for your neighbors to keep their bellies full. It's part of your security plan. If you don't do that and they're starving to death, they're going to turn on you. They're going to turn on you directly themselves or they're going to roll over and demand that the government commit mm -hmm. seat stuff and, and uh, impose martial law. So it's not in your best interest to ignore your neighbors. Prepare to feed them, even with just beans and rice and oatmeal. Um, but your church, your church, your local church, should be the distribution point for that. You do not want them coming to your house for food relief because then they all know you have food, and it makes you very vulnerable and exposed. So that's why you have to cultivate. Right after the neighborhood watch, you must go to your church and cultivate your local neighborhood church as the, the, the um, charity distribution point for your community. And then you got to secure a good uh, church security team. And we'll have future webinars on exactly that, on how to secure, a, a, how to create and train up a good security team for your local church. But we're also going to have another webinar on what we call Family Safe, which is the uh, pledge we have as Oath Keepers to guard and protect the families of the first responders, the police, the EMTs, and the firefighters, so they can go out and project out and do their jobs. But really, the most important element is that neighborhood watch. Without that, everything else falls apart. OK, so now it's to Ivan and Jim, and you guys have the floor. <clears throat> OK, thank you, Stuart. 
All right, folks. Uh, part of the reason that uh, I wrote this uh, Neighborhood Watch with Teeth definition and then let Stuart uh, polish it up a bit and put some other points in there for us is it doesn't do any good to explain to people um, that the fact that we're going to start a neighborhood watch with teeth if we don't explain what those teeth are and how this whole program works. So what we did is we took uh, the CPT trifold and we explained that in detail at all of our meetings. And in there, it clearly defines that we are setting up a neighborhood watch with teeth. So that's what this seminar is all about, or webinar. Um, we're gonna go through some things here on the contingency plan itself. And what this is designed for is to allow you to have a plan put together, even if you don't have your neighborhood watch set up or your neighbors all on board with you, this is going to give you an opportunity to plan your area in a step-by-step -step program that is in no way, shape, or form a final program, but it's gonna give you the basic outline of how you're going to put this all together. So let's start. <clears throat> Step number one, this is the critical thing. Talk to your neighbors. You've gotta get out there and talk to them and explain the Neighborhood Watch Program and the AFOC um, Neighborhood Protection Plan. The AFOC manual is by all intents and purposes our Bible for how we're going to set up when everything comes apart. Now, when we say this is a contingency plan, this is not your normal neighborhood watch program that you most of you would be familiar with if you're involved with the police departments and the sheriff's department's programs. That is the basic foundation. What we do is we take it to another level. So the AFOC book is our Bible. The NPP is the Neighborhood Protection Plan, which is the actual contingency plan itself. So what you wanna do is talk to your neighbors, and we, we took a question already before the webinar even started on how to talk to your neighbors and not come off as a complete wacko. Well, that's simple. <clears throat> Don't go out and talk to your neighbors in full battle rattle with camouflage paint and an AR slung on your back. All right, you're, these are your normal neighbors you talk to and greet every day. Go and talk to them about current events, feel them out politically, talk to them about how they feel, what would happen in the event of civil unrest, which we're seeing play out every day right now. And this civil unrest we're seeing just because of this election cycle is growing and it's not looking good out there. So talk to your neighbors and say, hey, you know, we have a plan we're putting this together. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself as an Oath Keeper. Um, but, you know, talk to them about the fact that it's good to have a neighborhood watch where we can look out for one another and be prepared in the event things really start to come apart at the seams. Now, in different areas of the country, obviously, you know, in the rural setback areas, it's going to be less of an issue in the interim. But in the, in the cities or the more uh, populated um, suburban areas, this is a problem already. So this is why we put this program together. So what you're gonna wanna do is start to recruit help into what we call a core element. You're gonna wanna get four or five people together that are on board with you, that are willing to work, and to put together a program that's gonna start to build your foundation. Building a foundation is critical. Have a plan, have your people understand what that plan is, so that when it all comes apart at the seams, you have the basics already down on paper and you know what you're going to do exactly so that you don't get caught with your pants down in the event of a disaster. <clears throat> now, we're gonna use the forms in the AFOC manual in the very back of the book on pages 392, 93, and 94, we have some forms there. So Larry, go ahead and scroll down to the first form. Now, this is something you can use uh, right out of the manual, and this information is going to be made available in a PDF format, so you'll be able to download it so that you'll have this basic outline available to you. But what I want to do is just go over the NPP survey questionnaire and address checklist. And what it basically says, and this is exactly, it's written as a script. This is what you take, and you can just read it right to your neighbors if you want to. But it says, I live in this area and I'm your neighbor. We're having a neighborhood meeting about protecting our neighborhood against fire and protecting it by whatever means necessary 
against criminals, rioters, and looters in support of our fire and police departments. If an emergency or disaster strikes and they are unable to respond, and that's critical to explain that to them, that you're not here as a vigilante or a militia group. You are here to support and sustain your neighborhood, as Jack Lawson mentioned, uh, until you know s some semblance of order can be restored. And it says here, I'm not in charge of this, but I'm helping others organize. And even if you are in charge of this, just put it out there that way. That kind of makes people feel a little more comfortable. And it says, we're going to vote to elect two experienced people to lead our group at the meeting, and we'll answer all your questions there. Would you be willing to help the rest of us and come to our meeting? This is the first step, is to get people to get up off their couches and come to a meeting. And then what you do is you put down their name and their address, and you simply check yes or no. Are they willing to come? If it's no, we don't want anything to do with you. We think you're a complete nut job. Go on to the next guy. You, you know, be courteous, be friendly, be professional. Don't come off as an extremist. Don't get into conspiracy theories, for God's sakes. That doesn't work. Don't start going off on the Illuminati and all this other craziness that we know is real. But uh, the average person out there doesn't know that. We're focusing on protecting our neighborhoods from civil unrest. Okay. <clears throat> the next slide. Our Neighborhood Protection Plan Statement of Purpose. This is as clear and concise as we can make it. It says, this neighborhood protection plan is intended to protect our neighborhood area in times of emergency, civil unrest, and disaster. All of these issues have happened in the past. We had the flooding in uh, Louisiana. We have civil unrest going on everywhere right now. We've had other disasters, fire, flood, earthquake, tornado, what have you, where looting was an issue. So this is not something out of you know, the ordinary. This is perfectly normal for our society. Our objective is to protect our neighborhood against fire our, if our area fire department is unable to respond timely. So that's a big deal. If you can provide fire protection for yourselves and your neighbors, that's a big selling point. Our objective is to protect our neighborhood against looters and criminals if law enforcement is unable to respond timely or unable to maintain order during a disaster. Pretty simple, cut and dry. Our NPP is being formed and when organized is for the sole purposes above and each member is acting as a neighborhood guardian to promote and secure this purpose. You as a group member of our NPP agree that we are not a militia. This has been authorized or we are not a militia that has been authorized or deputized by any city, state, or federal government entity or law enforcement agency to carry out law enforcement, and you agree to conduct yourselves accordingly. Now, this is a big deal because we get accused all the time of being a crazy right-wing wacko militia by the uh, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and a, and a whole slew of other, the ADL. Everybody puts us in that category, and, and Stewart has done... Uh, his very best to explain this on no, numerous occasions that we're not a militia, we have no formal rank, we have no authority given to us or granted by a county or a state government. So that ends that right off the bat. Because people are going to ask, are you a militia? The answer is no. <clears throat> okay, each group member will act responsibly and respectfully towards all people within and outside our neighborhood to the best of their ability each group member agrees to refrain from vigilante actions and will use force in defense and only as a last resort in protecting our neighborhood. You are more than authorized to use whatever force is necessary to protect life and property, especially when it comes to arson. And as we've been seeing, there's plenty of arson going on out there. Um, write any questions you have on the back of this paper. So that's the basic uh, statement of purpose. You can make copies of this and hand it to your neighbors so that they know exactly who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. <clears throat> okay, last form, MPP group member information. This information is voluntary and will be held in the strictest of confidence by our neighborhood protection plan leadership and council. You've expressed a desire to become a member of our Neighborhood Protection Plan. 
This information is voluntary. However, for our neighborhood protection plan to be effective, leadership has to have some basic information about you and your capabilities to enable you to help us to the maximum of your abilities. So you're going to need some contact information, their name, email, address, phone numbers, all that good stuff. <clears throat> then the checklist. And this is very helpful because this is going to allow you to find out who has military, law enforcement training, firearms, medical training, radio communications, food storage preparation and training, construction experience, and so on. Now, <clears throat> this was something written by Jack Lawson. If you notice the way this is laid out, it almost duplicates our community preparedness team plan. It has all of the same things in it. So what we're doing as Oath Keepers is we train in our group meetings that the neighborhood watch is the basic foundation. It's the camp that we would be training the people within. The community preparedness team concept is the plan or the NPP, Neighborhood Protection Plan, and that the Oath Keeper members that are trained in these skill sets are the ones that will be coming into the different neighborhoods and helping to train them. So you get their age, their health issues, and what would you prefer to do in helping to protect your neighborhood and your neighbors? Now, <clears throat> when I worked this out with our police department, I presented this. In fact, we gave our chief of police a copy of the manual, and we gave a copy of the uh, AFOC manual to our sheriff. The chief of police told me flat out, he says, you help me get my neighborhood watches set up, and we will bring Oath Keepers in to train these neighborhoods, flat out. So, neighborhood watch. Basically, it is no longer the little old lady with a cell phone looking out her window and calling the police when she sees some strange looking character standing in the front yard. If you go on the internet and bring up the neighborhood watch program, you will find out that it has advanced itself to a whole nother level. That includes uh, basic preparations, uh, uh, all types of uh, preparedness training. Uh, what else in there? The security aspect, uh, counterterrorism. You know, yes, the, I know people get crazy about the see something, say something, but you know what? A lot of crimes have been solved, and a lot of bad perpetrators out on these streets have been captured because a citizen saw something and he said something. Don't be afraid of that. This is not a rat your neighbor out because you don't like him politically. This is we're trying to protect people here and save lives. So that's what it's all about. It's down to crime prevention, basic preparedness, and counterterrorism techniques. Okay, step two, talk to your local police department or your sheriff's office and volunteer to help establish neighborhood watch groups in your area. Explain the AFOC manual and the neighborhood protection program, and if they are not receptive to the plan, do it anyway, it's not illegal. And that's gonna be emphasized in the manual when those of you who do get a manual eventually here um, those that have it, if you've read it, I highly recommend you read it again because you're going to find that there's more things in there that you missed the first two times. I've read it three or four times and I'm still finding things in it. But basically, uh, Jack Lawson emphasizes to do it regardless because this is important. You're not doing anything illegal. But it's good to go to your chief of police and your local sheriff and sit down with them and explain to them what this program is all about. And so far, We've had no negative feedback from any of our law enforcement. However, here in northern, north central Arizona, our law enforcement is very conservative. In the big cities, yeah, you might get some uh, pushback on some of this stuff. But it, the more you can present it in a professional, logical manner, the better it's going to be. And the people you want to have do that are going to be your retired law enforcement officers because they speak the same language as your sheriff and police. So that's critical. Okay, step three. Call a, Call a meeting of the whole neighborhood. Elect a group leader or a block captain, as it's called in neighborhood watch normally. Elect an assistant group leader. Elect a secretary and it's someone who can keep minutes and records of the meetings because that's gonna be critical. You're gonna have a lot of paperwork to do. Um, our recommendation, a daytime barbecue works well, weather permitting, 
if you can make it this far, you're doing pretty well. This is one of the hardest parts to accomplish. If you can get your neighbors together, uh, that's a big step. And start to talk to them and start to get organized. Uh, what we've done in our area is when we hold neighborhood watch meetings, it's for all of the different neighborhood watches to come together and have one meeting so that the police can explain things. But those have been less than successful. Uh, the police department is not that well organized and they don't have the proper training to do this. When Oath Keepers, well, I'll give you an example. Our police department had a neighborhood watch meeting and eight people showed up. Six of them were our Oath Keepers. And we just went in there to see how they run it. So I told the, uh, the gal that ran this thing for us, I said, Marilee, why don't you let me run a meeting? She said, go right ahead. So the next time we held a neighborhood watch meeting, we put it out to all the Oath Keeper members and this was back, you know, over a year ago, uh, we had 65 people show up at the first meeting. And now our Oath Keeper meetings are averaging right around 125 people every meeting, and Neighborhood Watch is just part of it. So we're doing pretty well at getting people interested, but it's all in the presentation, guys. You've got to be able to sell this. You've got to believe in what you're doing. You've got to understand the program. And you've got to study the manuals and how this works, because this is not your average neighborhood watch. This is way more advanced. Okay, Ivan, I am going to turn this over to you. And what Ivan is going to do is explain to you guys the four principles of patrolling. Go ahead, Larry. Uh, switch. Off mute. Yeah, we've got a slide called Four Principles of Patrolling. Should be the next one, Larry. There we go. All right. Okay, let's get right into this. Uh, we appreciate your guys' time. I'll uh, loop right along here. Planning. Uh, develop a plan now before this event hits you. And I tell you what, uh, this is all a plan that is going to be used hopefully it never gets used, but uh, that would be beyond the scope of a neighborhood watch. And a neighborhood watch is just not built. And the whole psychology of it is not going to be able to comprehend the reality of a failure of stability if that were to happen. A failure of stability meaning uh, a reality of which people will be fighting each other like animals. That is far from our reality now. Thank goodness, and hopefully it stays that way. And uh, this plan, NPP, Neighborhood Protection Plan, would only come into effect in, in uh, a physical sense as the ability of law enforcement and other emergency response services uh, start to diminish. Until then, there would be no reason to uh, put this plan into action because these plans are are somewhat dy dystopic. So, uh, but you've got to gather, gather a plan now because if you don't, there won't be no plan there and you'll have to wing it and that just is, not, is no bueno. Uh, proper prior planning prevents just poor performance. Pardon my French, but that's just the truth of it. So, uh, even if you don't have all your neighbors fully on board, as you won't, there will always be neighbors that will be non-participants in the Neighborhood Protection Plan. Uh, getting some of your neighbors, and I see a lot of the question, uh, this is a problem here. We all have this in our neighborhood. Getting some of your neighborhoods, uh, or some part, is uh, obviously what you want to do. Get them on board, get a small group of you and uh, that would be the way to go. Uh, first, neighborhood watch, and once you have that going, then you can have this available as a uh, mindset and a plan. You know, this process of uh, four principles patrolling goes from planning into recon. Uh, recon, Google Ultra Cursor Neighborhood, get maps if you can, uh, satellite imagery, uh, print them out, have to take them. If you can't do that, to walk your neighborhood, and do sketches in the street, put down everyone's name and address. All this recon has everything to do with uh, writing down also who your doctors are, who your nurses are, who the welder is, 
who the uh, construction guys are uh, to put these these down here, but these are going to uh, work right into your plan, your medical your plan, your uh, communications plan. You might have a ham radio, uh, amateur radio guy in your neighborhood. You want that on your map where he lives because uh, you're going to want to set up a, a communication center uh, with your FRS radios. Uh, Alfang radios, H777 radios, whatever you have, GMRS, FRS. So uh, your doctors and nurses, of course, same thing. And your watch center, you want all those uh, buildings relatively uh, close together, hopefully somewhere in the middle, so that you can uh, best affect your neighborhood protection plan. And uh, walk your entire perimeter and make notes of weak points and where you place defensive positions. Again, goes right into planning. And uh, to be honest, we have a lot of, uh, uh, this, this, this could go on quite a, a while, you could tell, so I'm not going to get into the depths of it, but uh, this, this goes into very uh, detailed plans, and uh, once you start getting into the, uh, uh, the plan, then you start getting into vegetation, uh, homes, avenues of approach, and uh, it all works together, and control control keep control of your people especially at night two man buddy teams always maintain calm at all times do a good guard roster and practice during the daylight hours to be efficient and that's going to be the uh, the hard part because this comes right down to guard duty uh, having some kind of uh, guard post uh, we're talking about a real dystopic situation far beyond uh, the scope of our reality now and the police and emergency services were not responding then and only then we uh, suggest blocking a street off because I mean it would be stupid to do that and uh, it's illegal for Pete's sake so we're not advocating anybody do this at any other time than when emergency services are no longer available for responding and uh Security, uh, protect the perimeter, man entry and exit control points, uh, rotate your guards every two hours, exercise good noise and light discipline at night. It's for these military guys going to come in handy. Uh, this was their life for years. Uh, each household will be also be a responsible to watch their part of the perimeter when not on guard duty. And then... Uh, you start getting into the thick of this, you go right back to the very beginning and you do this process over again, planning, recon, control, security, until you get some semblance of a uh, cohesive, comprehensive plan together, because that's what you're looking to do. And again, this is just a plan. I have it available so that when uh, the SHTF, then somebody has a plan. And if you don't get this together with just a few neighbors, get on board with each other, then uh, you know, there, these other people are going to come up with a plan. And you're not going to like that because it's going to go uh, off into the weeds real quick. And uh, there's going to be a lot of failure. So uh, to sum that up, a good plan executed today is better than a uh, perfect plan executed at some indefinite point in the future. There's a, it's a lot of quotes on planning. And uh, let's go to the next slide. All right. So I read the note at the end, Ivan. Absolutely. That's actually a good point. It's been proven that a general rule, anytime a mission has failed, it was a failure of adhering to one of the four principles of patrolling. Pay attention to detail follow the principles in your mission uh, and your mission has a much better chance of success. Be ready for Mr. Murphy because as another quote you probably, probably heard before no plan survives enemy contact. And you're going to have to start this process all over again. Uh, at least one part of it because there will be failures and uh, hopefully the plan can change and hopefully that will be the weak point. It was your plan not your people. So uh, what we're trying to do here is also uh, teach perspective because perspective being thought is the, uh, the cause of all the effects in our future. So this, this is perspective. 
and uh, planning. It all goes together. All right, here we are. Uh, next. Uh, all right. Step four. Begin planning for your security of your neighborhood's perimeter. Figure out where you will post guard. You're going to need a guard post uh, for your entry exit control points, and uh, you're going to need listening and observation posts, depending on your your neighborhood's uh, terrain, the way it's laid out. Uh, it's uh, Every neighborhood's different. I have no idea what your neighborhood looks like, and you have no idea what mine looks like, and uh, we can't uh, come up with the same kinds of plan. And make sure that you come up with a plan that's going to fit your situation. Don't uh, make your situation fit some kind of plan. That's, that's definitely a, a failure. Uh, guard post, listening observation post, marksman positions, and uh, outflanker marksman positions. It, as things get bad, if they were to get bad, it goes out of the neighborhood watch and into a neighborhood protection plan, which is uh, pretty extreme, then uh, things get to the point where uh, they become ramped up. This is all a, a scale. And when we talk about outflanker and marksman, we're talking about just what it says, that that marksman is outside the perimeter and he is to flank intruders. And uh, that's, uh, that's extreme when you start thinking about it. Again, that's perspective. And uh, at no point in time would this be used when uh, police are, are able to respond? Just you have me to make that uh, point, uh, marksman as well, because uh, if the police aren't able to respond, then we have to uh, respond, and uh, that's that's our station in life. I mean, I was asked years ago in my own neighborhood uh, when we were putting up the uh, the decorations at the front of our neighborhood when I suggested that this neighborhood is easy very easily defense defensible that lady looked at me and said you've given this a lot of thought haven't you and what she was insinuating was that uh, you've given this too much thought haven't you and I thought about that and honestly we have to think about this because they won't it's my station in life. It's who I am. Uh, I'm the ranger in uh, her neighborhood, and that's just my job. Uh, now, you don't have to be a ranger, and uh, we're not advocating that I have to be uh, some kind of special forces or even military guided to an activist. In fact, that's why the book is written, to tell your civility. It puts it together in very uh, clear, easy to read, and teachable language. Let's move on to the next point. Figure out how you walk off the street. Again, when the police are not able to respond, then you might have to. If things were to get very bad, people start fighting each other like animals, and people start running into people's neighborhoods, killing people and whatnot, uh, thank God we're a long ways away from that. At that point in time, yes, you might consider blocking off the street. If the cops aren't coming in, Cavalry's not coming, you're going to want to block off your street. And it's something to really think about. How are you going to do that? Is, uh, is, your, cars, is your name Frank, sir? No. no my name is Ivan. What, what's your name, sir? Ivan. I, I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names. This is Jack Lost. I'd just like to inject one thing. Yes. Uh, Please do. So everybody knows, you know, everybody thinks we're talking about. Uh, a situation where the world turns into uh, escape from New York or the road. Uh, the first danger I think people should realize, depending on the event that happens, the first danger I think people should really look at is groups of people. You can call them gangs if you want, but, you know, like one man's terrorists is another man's freedom fighter. There, there could be people out there just as good as you or your neighbors, but the first threat's going to come by vehicle, most likely. That's 
You know, that's what people should look for. Uh, one of the people that contacted me was a guy that works at an electronic, uh, uh, he works in, in, in an area, he didn't reveal anything to me that's classified, but he works with EMP equipment, and he told me that contrary to what's in the book one second after, that uh, any vehicle over 1985 that's got electronics will stop running. That is not true. Only 6% of the vehicles they're estimating will not run. 70% of the ones that do run won't have any dashboard controls. And that's all I wanted to interrupt and say. So your first, their first threat's most likely going to come from vehicles. So the likely approaches to your perimeter, the likely approaches by road should be definitely under uh, uh, fire from somebody that's a designated marksman type person. That's all. I'm yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Thanks for bringing that up, Jeff, because uh, that brings up a real good point. Uh, as things get bad, if they were to get bad, and uh, let's hope they don't, there will be vehicles driving through your area scoping your neighborhood out. Because uh, like these uh, human hunter predators, as Jack uh, mentions in his book, the law enforcement term, they look for weak points. They're the lions that are looking at the uh, zebras and whatnot, and they, they're they scoping you out. They're looking for the uh, the herd that has weak members where they can strike, and uh, they're going to be driving to your neighborhood. Do not put up defenses uh, that are going to be used when things get really bad. Like, for instance, uh, you may have uh, engagement areas. Uh, you can call them other things such as uh, kill zones. You could call them uh, fatal funnels, whatnot. But uh, let's just call them engagement areas. You don't want to set up an engagement area or anything like that for well while things are still good. First of all, it's bad psychology for your neighbors, but also uh, it, you don't want to let people know what your defenses are. Uh, only when you have your neighborhood blocked off do you start erecting those kinds of defenses. Uh, so uh, that's a good point. Uh, at that point in time, things are very dystopic. These are the, this would be like the first stages of uh, a failure of stability. But uh, things are just horribly, horribly wrong in America. Now, plan for a location for medical purposes, a doctor's house or a nurse or EMT slash paramedic. Uh, this is part of your planning stage. Find out who these people are and uh, make sure that you identify them and uh, just start on a neighborhood watch kind of uh, conversation. Do not get into this neighborhood protection plan business that we're talking about with anybody but the most uh, receptive, let's say that. Uh, most people are not going to be receptive to this, and there's a lot of people that are not going to be uh, thinking like this, and that's okay, and that's, you know, that's, that's healthy to not think like this. Hopefully this kind of plan is not necessary. And uh, let's get into the next slide, moving right along. Uh, why a quick reaction force? We can call this response guardians. We can call it rapid response team. Uh, basically, uh, if things get bad, uh, you need to have a, a small team. Uh, people respond very uh, quickly in a short time frame to emergencies in mere minutes. And that's why uh, you need your neighborhood protection plan, your area to be a size where you can run from one side of neighborhood protection uh, plan, a protected perimeter, uh, one side to the other. And uh, that right there, that kind of dictates how small uh, and how too small and how too big is. But if an NPT gets too small, then you have uh, a problem with not enough people. Just think about this. If you're going to have a guard post and you're going to have to at least guard one, entry exit point and then you have uh, roving guards and you're going to have uh, people to watch that you're going to need about a couple dozen people uh, and that's that's going to take a size sizable amount of neighborhood so you're going to have to have uh, the neighborhood big big enough 
but not to be too big that you can't run across the whole entire neighborhood uh, in some kind of uh, reasonable fashion. Uh, so the rapid response team, their job is to reinforce a perimeter during an attack. Uh, in a pinch, uh, you can uh, take your uh, roving or patrol uh, guardians uh, and make your, uh, your rapid response team up, your response guardians, but all of those guys uh, or gals uh, need to be alpha guardians. By alpha guardians, I mean people that are generally very fit people who can lift considerable weight and do hard work. Those are alpha guardians. And most of your response team, uh, if not all, need to be those alpha guardians, however a small number of people, four people, something like that, uh, try to do at least that. So I go through the slide. You may have limited personnel, so you will need a small, agile team that can move to fill a gap and under attack, uh, if under attack. You will need at least four men. Again, can be ladies, two 12-hour shifts. So that's now eight men, eight people. Could be a mom and a son. I mean, it doesn't have to be men. This group will be primarily responsible for security. They will have limited responsibilities outside of security. At this stage, your neighborhood will be somewhat secure, at least planning stage. Now, I just want to go on uh, about uh, before we hand this over to Jim. Your MPP uh, it has to have this response team that is the most proactive uh, part of your defense. Uh, we're talking about uh, your response guardians are, are acting as the little Dutch boy or your local neighborhood SWAT team at the board. Your job is to plug holes in your uh, protective perimeter defense by reinforcing part of your uh, protective perimeter that is under attack. So say if you have a uh, intruders coming in up at a uh, guard post, then goodness gracious. Now oh, the audio is out, huh? This my luck. Uh, should I go on? having problems. Lost the audio. What, what's your name, sir? My name is Ivan Shaplinsky. Ivan. Okay, Ivan. I'm sorry. I, I'm terrible with names. Um, I don't know who else is on, but... Uh, could yeah, see, I'm called in, and I think all the people that are uh, on their computers, uh, they have no audio, and uh, the people that are on the phone can probably still hear me. So... I'm just going to assume that and keep on trucking, and uh, yeah. better than saying yeah. nothing. So yeah. NPP Not again, how big or how small your NPP is is uh, it needs to be a small enough area to allow your uh, response guardians and your uh, guardian runners to run quickly from one side of the protected perimeter to the most distant side of the uh, by the shortest route, and now they'll have to do just that if you are attacked. And uh, Audio is good on the PC. Okay, I just heard from another, uh, somebody else in Florida that audio is good, so I'm going to keep going. Uh, now, your response guardians, they will have to do just that. If you're attacked, they'll race to your uh, guard post, and uh, they might have to form that L uh, together with the uh, guard posts, uh, L-shaped engagement area. You might have heard that as uh, L-shaped ambush. No, that's not uh, that's not uh, offensive. That is proactive defense. That's exactly what we're we're about here. So, uh, don't send all of your response guardians to your guard post unless it's an attack, because you might have a distraction at that guard post, and you might have intruders uh, actually doing a decoy attack and then actually attack from another area. So. Uh, 
those response guards are to form a flanking maneuver on your guard post so that they can uh, shoot or uh, at least engage the intruders from another direction. So, uh, yeah, anything to add on that part, Jack? Say again? You got anything to add on that part when you're talking about response? No, you're doing a good job. Really, that route there is a super important part of the uh, neighborhood protection plan because that's the most proactive part as far as the layers of security go. Is Jim on? Or are we all alone here? Well, I'm assuming that I, we're I, alone. I, I don't know who's, uh, whether our audio is getting out to anybody either. I imagine that right. it's going through something Stuart's got. Okay. However, so I'll tell you I don't what. know how you and I are talking. Right. So uh, I'm assuming that there's going to be a lot of people still on. We've got 494. Yeah, why, why right you now. got the floor, man? Why don't you just run with the ball there? Yeah. Yeah, that might be the lone survivor, right? All right. So this would be a good point. Uh, where you want to be training on a routine basis with your security people. All of this has to be practiced. And uh, shooting drills, combo training, tactics, basic medical, most important, just get to know one another. Uh, this will build unit cohesion. It's going to build morale. It's going to, more than anything, it's going to build confidence in that people that thought that no plan would work are going to see that, wow, what a great thing is happening here. There's people that actually... Uh, a real service and tax form for these people uh, forming this neighborhood protection plan. Uh, they'd be in, everybody would be, uh, well, just like on the other neighborhoods, they could be uh, a burned out shell. That, so, guardians, uh, that's a good word. My wife really likes that word uh, with regards to a failure of stability, uh, the book. And uh, let's discuss the guardians. They are a group that is responsible for protecting everyone else. It's not everybody because you've got Alpha Guardians and you've got Bravo Guardians. The Bravo Guardians are the uh, folks that have some limiting uh, uh, factor of their physicality. So uh, not that they're any less. Uh, they're, big, they're good for guard posts or the watch center. So these are the teeth of the neighborhood watch these guardians. They will have limited outside responsibilities as far as day-to-day -day functions and day neighborhood camp, such as food growing, water hauling, and purifying laundry maintenance and whatnot. Uh, it is important to note that in order to secure a neighborhood properly, security is a 24-7 operation. Again, this is in times where it's really bad, and neighborhood watch just will not cut the dystopic reality. Once your neighborhood is secure, it would be a good uh, idea to put together a team which can operate outside the wire this team would have two functions. Area recon to be able to notify perimeter of approaching danger and also to be uh, able to liaison with other neighborhoods for the purpose of mutual aid. Heck, you could be uh, going out to uh, the other neighborhoods and teaching this. So, looks like I got a message here uh, from Larry Ivan Carry On. We can't hear you, but the audience can. Well, they're the ones that matter, right? All right, communications been a lot of uh, questions with regards to communications and radios. This is critical. Uh, without, you ain't got comma, you ain't got jack. And everybody uh, knows that you, if you could go back in time and change any battle uh, with uh, just one piece of equipment, it would be radios. So, you know, technically, yeah, two pieces of equipment. But uh, if you could stand on one wall. Uh, Ivan, can I interrupt you and say something? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I strongly suggest if people do go to the police department or the local law enforcement they're sure for whatever, number one, ask them if they have a Faraday cage. I was astounded that nobody in my area even knows what a Faraday cage is. Uh, yeah, we the see, reason uh, I'm that. Yeah, this is we to stop the, yeah, this is to stop the destruction of electronic communication devices that have to be stored. Every law enforcement agency will be actually totally hamstrung by this if 
there's an EMP. And the reason I'm saying this, uh, people that have called and talked to me, the EMP thing is moving way up the ladder. That That's a very big, real danger yeah. now. So that's why we held it. Anyway, uh, ask your police department if they have Faraday cage. Yes, right. We had a webinar here just a few weeks ago. A lot of the uh, attendees tonight uh, attended also the uh, emergency communications webinar where we uh, went into depth and detail on Faraday cages, uh, galvanized trash cans, the uh, aluminum uh, HVAC tape. Uh, to go around it to fill any uh close any pinholes and so forth and so on so yeah it, they're up on that and uh that was if anyone uh needs to see that it's on youtube so that's uh, a good point to bring up jack thank you yeah if nothing else the, their police department should look at investing uh three four depending on size uh you know for every officer right. they should get a just plain gmrs which is a family frequency radio, and stick it in a Faraday cage. They've at least got some kind of radio communications, uh, worst case yeah, scenario. Bit. Yeah, if you're not using uh, radios, uh, use your uh, SHTS comms, if you will. Uh, get a trash can from Tractor Supply or Home Depot or Lowe's and uh, get some HVAC tape, that's that aluminum tape, uh, and uh, line your trash can with cardboard get your radios in there, tape it up, and just forget about it until, you know, this, this stuff happens. Uh, so that if you ever do have an EMP event, God forbid, then uh, your your goodies will still be usable. So you must have a good base station, radio, and, uh, you know, start looking at that, Googling that, and uh, start doing research. Uh, well protect within the perimeter. Uh, but uh, with regards to FRS, GMRS frequencies, they'll work best in a neighborhood. If your neighborhood is uh, a size where you can run from one side to the other relatively quickly, uh, bubble pack radios are great. A lot of people do recommend them. If you've got nothing else, that's great. However, you can go into eBay, just type in H777. And uh, those radios are available for $15 a piece. They're like the Baofeng, only they're uh, UHF only. They're programmable. Uh, the same programming cable as the uh, Baofeng and uh, it's free chirp software. And uh, they, they're actually, I've got one here, and it's, uh, it's the same radio that was uh, used in that uh, movie, uh, Arm Amerigeddon. Uh, and uh, you'll see it in that one scene where uh, that girl uh, tips the uh, radio off over into the mulch bin. And uh, that was a Retevis, Retevis H77. And they're $15 a piece on eBay. You can buy uh, 20 of them for like less than $12 a piece on Amazon and get uh, 20 heads at 20 charges all for like $235. So I think a neighborhood can uh, afford that, if nothing else. Uh, they're for a base station, you want a more powerful base station that'll be advantageous. Again, find your ham guys in your neighborhood, uh, get to know people, be the change you want to see in the world. Don't uh, be uh, another one of these people in the neighborhood that doesn't want to talk to anybody. You've got to be that crazy person, but don't be that crazy person that's bringing up NDP when uh, you just need to be uh, starting a neighborhood watch for Pete's sake. So uh, buy extra bubble pack radios if that's what you want to do. Uh, those are good too. It's better than nothing. That's the main thing. Anything is better than nothing. If you can get your neighborhood squared away enough, make a bulk purchase so all the handheld radios match. This will make training easier. Don't forget extra batteries, rechargeable setups, solar capabilities. Get the solar panels, charge these uh, radios in at least one house. Make sure the base station is off the grid. Make sure that's in a Faraday cage. Uh, if you're not going to be using it, it's going to be most all the time now. Full training exercises with your radios. Uh, that's, again, when you're uh, having a, a difficult time, uh, then, uh, yeah, uh, when things are dystopic, yeah, uh, whole training exercises. And then with the guard, few people that you can get together in your neighborhood, uh, go ahead and train ex whole tr small training exercises, just a few people like that. Uh, just get a small number of people in your neighborhood on board with this NTP. Uh, this is after you start a neighborhood watch. Again, after you start a neighborhood watch. And uh, start holding training exercises, start training at the range of those guys. Uh, teach basic military communications techniques and 
if you don't know any of that, uh, it's all available online. And uh, U.S. Military Phonetic Alphabet, again, totally Googleable. Googleable. Train and practice. Uh, looks like. Oh well. Second, we got problems with the webinar. Janet. Ivan, I'm, I'm here, uh, Ivan. Yeah, Jack. I don't, I don't know. Right, if so we're some people are hearing us, some people aren't, and we're just going to keep going with what we've got because we've got 465 people on the webinar, and they wouldn't still be here if they couldn't hear me. So we're going to keep going. All right. All right. Thanks. Good deal. Bye. All right. Moving on to medical which is just as important. Medical, this topic is so vital to the survival of your neighborhood watch group. Do not take it lightly. You will need to be able to handle emergencies far beyond first aid. We're talking about uh, the possibility, God forbid, uh, gunshot wounds. Uh, we're talking about having IFACs, having uh, immediate decompression skills. Uh, get a first aid uh, class going in your neighborhood, get that EMT, that paramedic, get that medic, uh, 68 whiskey from the Army, uh, Navy corpsman, uh, doesn't have to be in your neighborhood, uh, it could be outside, it's somewhere in your county or in the surrounding counties, uh, any kind of classes, start putting on classes now, and it doesn't matter if you uh, do it as Oath Keepers or do it in your own group, uh, basically we want this to happen all over the country so that America is more prepared so that uh, we can actually stop this, a failure of civility, which is the whole intent here. So as a minimum, Oath Keeper stresses the uh, CLS, the Combat Lifesaver course, available in the CPT section uh, on our national website at oathkeepers.org. And uh, however, this is still not enough. Uh, you would be very fortunate to find an EMT, paramedic, or trauma nurse with ER experience. However, if you can't find these qualified people, can gear up as best you can with all the supplies you can afford because it would be easier to find a qualified medic somewhere than a, full, than a box full of medical supplies uh, during a uh, time when you, there's not even any food on the shelf. And again, I've got to stress that this is during a failure of stability when people are fighting each other like animals and uh, what would cause the failure of stability, again, for perspective sake, is when there is no food or water where somehow very limited supply on a protracted basis in a long-term failure stability. We're talking about a reality that it's hard to imagine, thank God. But uh, that, the medical, it's huge. Uh, on to uh, continue on the medical, your security team members will need two IFACs, improved first aid kits. That's what IFAC stands for, folks. Uh, improved first aid kit or an individual first aid kit. One gunshot trauma kit, one basic IFAC with extra supplies added. I recommend a drop, a drop leg gunshot trauma kit and another IFAC attached to your web gear. Uh, but uh, we need to have the skills, the knowledge, uh, whether it's medical or whether it's firearms. I think that's the, one of the most important things. The knowledge is the most important thing for you to be carrying. Uh, it doesn't do you much good to have uh, medical gear, especially uh, things like immediate decompression needle or uh, chest seals if you don't know how to use them. And uh, you know, training, training, you can lose your gear, you're not going to lose your training. It stays with you, more valuable. Train your groups to be able to apply the cat tourniquet properly, the Israeli pressure bandage. Uh, pick this stuff up, stuff up on eBay, uh, pick it up on uh, various other uh, websites. Uh, Sometimes there's fakes being made uh, as far as cat tourniquets go, so try to make sure that you're buying the real deal and not a, a, a discount version that looks like it might be a, a fake to anything that's too good to be true probably uh, is. So there are fake cat tourniquets out there. Learn to splint fractures. You might want to pick up some uh, splinting, uh, the SAM splint, uh, the SAM 2 splint, that's available on eBay. You can pick them up for a couple of them. Uh, for instance, some of these guys on the best offer 
uh, $5 a piece and uh, money in the bank is better than uh, splinting with sticks and uh, knowing how to use them. Buy or make splints in advance as well as strips of material to tie off splints. Invest in a couple of surplus stretchers. Yeah, that's a, that's a real perspective there. And uh, that might be exactly what you need. And if you do find yourself in that situation, you're, you and a lot of other people are going to be very glad that you were crazy enough to buy one or two stretchers. So these are just the basics of forming up your neighborhood watch group. There's a lot more training than organizing it to be done. So get started as soon as possible. Now, let's get to questions. I wonder if we can do questions. All right. Uh, I see some questions. We apologize for the FUBAR audio problem, Stuart says. We will make sure a copy is posted within the next few days on our YouTube channel. So it's just a glitch uh, with regards to the audio. Uh, and uh, so there's 451 particip participants. I wish I could take your question. And uh, we've got the author online, uh, Jack. Uh, he wrote A Failure of Civility and myself uh, between us. <laughs> it's probably more than enough special operations uh, experience to answer most questions, but it's a shame that we can't. So is there any way Ivan, do you mind or? if I say a couple? Yeah, go ahead. Ivan, do you mind go if ahead. I say a couple things? Um, I'd just like to address the following issues. Uh, you know, if anybody thinks this is off the wall, the neighborhood, uh, organizing your neighborhood, uh, people have to understand this. Ever since detente and the decline of the so-called Soviet empire from 1990 on, ever since the 1950s, the Chinese, when Mao Zedong took over, started a network of underground hardened uh, tunnels and survival areas. Uh, the Chinese have over 3,000 miles of sophisticated, I've seen pictures of the insides of these, sophisticated nuclear hardened survival areas. The Russians have a mountain in the Urals that they have virtually excavated under the entire mountain Nobody seems to know what they've been doing there since 1962. However, it's looked at as a uh, Armageddon survival center for the uh, for some 30,000 people. Now that supplies and everything, and supposedly for something like shutting the doors for two years. We've gone the other way. America has virtually everybody that's of. Well, I'm 70, but everybody of, of the age probably 50 on up, 40 maybe, remember your church, your school, had civil defense uh, supplies in the basements, and they had a, a, a system to bring people inside and underground. We don't do that anymore. Uh, th this is a, a total disaster what's going on. I don't know what we invest in civil defense spending every year, but none of it's going for anything that's productive. So uh, number, item number two, everybody uh, in this country is, is virtually got some impression, uh, good or bad, of firearms. Most of the people involved with Oath Keepers, military law enforcement, uh, they know it's a tool. It's a simple tool. However, when you're organizing your neighborhood, I think it's critically important that you don't try to hide it, but don't uh, expand on the weapons end of this and the force end of this right away. Get your first meeting uh, out of the way by having some just basic discussion of what you're trying to do. Uh, when you do get into the firearms, number one, safety, obviously. I've taught people shooting that have never touched a firearm before, and I've seen some pretty jacked up guys that get really nervous around guns. So this is, a, this is an issue that's an image thing. The image of 
when you do start to train of having grandpa's shotgun is better than having what some people consider a beautiful tricked out AR but it's that shotgun is is much less threatening looking to the average person the firearms thing is going to get you into trouble uh, with large law enforcement agencies you're not going to get any official approval of your uh, use of firearms now that being said on, there, yeah, there is let there, one moment I'm going to try to fix something see if I can try one thing again please Okay. I'm trying to enable uh, more audio control. And, Are you back uh, online? Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, I keep talking. Second. Go ahead, keep talking, keep going. I'm done. Keep going. All right, I'm just gonna, I'm just going to finish for on page 118 and 119, uh, along with the image that's going to frighten some people. Uh, I have three different levels that uh, uh, put together, basically, depending on, and these are all dictated. The level that you dress and display weapons is is going to be dictated by uh, the the increasing if this happens the increasing inability of law enforcement to get to your area. The worse the situation gets, the higher your level of dress should be. But like you mentioned earlier, uh, was it Frank, the other guy, Ivan? It was Jim. Jim. Jim Arroyo, yeah. Like, oh, was it Jim Arroyo? Okay. Uh, like Jim mentioned, you know, running around in multicam and all that scares the crap out of some people. This is the neighborhood protection program. The firearms part of this has got to be minimized until people are psychologically uh, prepared and accepting of what you're trying to do. So be careful showing the firearms. And uh, as long as you're lawful, by that I mean almost every state allows you to defend yourself on, I don't know about Illinois and New York, but Massachusetts. But most every state allows you to defend yourself on your own property. And I'm not talking about castle doctrine or, uh, you know, the use of uh, deadly force on your own property. Protect. If you're using weapons and you're in an area and you're not displaying them, uh, you're not flashing them around, uh, there's very little law enforcement can do. In fact, they probably off the record would approve what you do. But if you get into some of your areas, especially some of the more political leftist areas of the country, they may actually try to uh, stop you from, uh, you know, using the weapons. And that's the time you should have an epiphany and start looking at uh, maybe I got to move out of here. Because if you're in that type of area where self-defense, which is a God-given right, is denied you, then I think you better look at where you're living and maybe think about relocating. But uh, one thing that's critical, don't be talking about your preparation to your neighbors until you know who your neighbors are. I have my entire street, I started with the street here, and I've got virtually 240 houses. We've all got, we're on the same page and we've, we've kind of gone all of the, all over this stuff. Also, there's uh, uh, a couple of cities where uh, we sent cases of books. They've organized subdivisions. Uh, one of them is Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, they organized a number of subdivisions there. So uh, it's possible to do this. Now, I don't know what their level of organization is. But understand one thing. This is not about politics. When you have your meeting, that should be taboo. It should be as taboo as, well, at least for me, discussing politics at a family reunion because I've got some real whack jobs in my family on the other side of the fence. Of course, that's probably what they're calling me. But anyway, don't discuss politics. Keep that out of the, the meeting totally. And you're going to also find this last thing I have to say. After you canvass your neighbors, you're going to have some people reading the newspaper and like a magnet, their eyeballs and their mind is going to start picking up issues that are going on you see every day in the news 
and they're going to start getting a little more apprehensive about what's going on in the world, and they're probably going to come and knock at your door. So when you do canvas, let them know who they can talk to. If you've got one person that's going to volunteer to talk to them, have them uh, aware that there's one place they can go and talk to later on if they decide they want to do something. And that's all I have to say.